What is discussed on this program is meant to be for general information and educational purposes. It is not intended to be legal advice and should not be used for that purpose. If you have legal matters you need help with, then you need to seek the advice of an attorney. Hi, I'm AJ Sickman with the BBKCC Law Firm, and this is another episode of Legal Briefs. With me today is my partner, Walt Chittister, as well as Terry Masters, who is a guardian ad litem in the Wayne County Court System. Walt and Terry, welcome, and thanks for coming on the show with us today. Thank you. Uh, today, we're here to talk about the court system's role in our lives when we have children uh, and a relationship ends. Now, that could be through a divorce or what we call a juvenile paternity action, and we'll talk about that more a little bit later. Uh, Walt and I will talk, about, or we'll talk about an attorney's role in that process, and then Terry's going to discuss that process a little bit from a guardian ad litem's perspective. Um, so now, as I mentioned, in a custody-related matter, or sometimes referred to as a family law matter, <clears throat> that can arise in a couple of ways. Uh, Walt, if you could kind of walk us through how someone might find themselves in that situation initially. Um, it'd be where um, two parties, a husband and wife, can't get along, or if it's a mother and father, um, that are living together, uh, have never established uh, paternity, they would have to file a petition to uh, establish paternity and determine custody of the child. With the husband and wife, it would be a matter of filing a petition for dissolution of marriage. And once that happens, that sets in motion a few things, right? Correct. So if we could kind of talk about from a, a zoomed out approach, uh, what you might expect relative to your role as an attorney and assisting someone through a family law matter. Uh, it would be uh, after they were be interviewing with an attorney uh, and filing the papers in court, then you would be having what are called pretrial conferences uh, where you have to go to court um, and file these papers to um, set out the issues that are there. Uh, you eventually get to status conference uh, as the case moves along um, as to what matters are resolved, what aren't. And then finally you get the issue of the, um, hopefully, the mediation and uh, informally and then both formally. So now that's kind of a summary version of what a parent might expect if they find themselves in that situation. And we'll delve into that a little bit further mm -hmm. uh, later on in the show. But obviously when you're representing a, representing a client, you're doing that <clears throat> as counsel and as an advocate for that person. Is that right? Correct. Uh, and that may be a little bit different than your role, Terry, as a guardian ad litem in this situation. Is that right? That is correct, yes. Okay. Uh, so if you could uh, kind of explain to us just generally what a guardian ad litem does and what your role is in the court system. Well, uh, a guardian ad litem is a, an advocate for the children involved either in a divorce case or a paternity case. And uh, we have to do what is in the best interests of the children. Um, the best interest of the children is always a determining factor as far as custody and parenting time. And uh, we go through and uh, we interview um, the parents um, and sometimes there are other significant adults in the children's lives that will be interviewed. Uh, and if the children are able to, to be interviewed, then we interview them and uh, sometimes we make home visits to see their environment at home. Mm -hmm. And um, then we gather all that information and uh, provide it to um, the judge. Okay. Uh, and I actually had to look this up, but the, the term guardian ad litem is a Latin term that translates to guardian of the lawsuit. So you, you're really an objective eyes and ears of the court to represent the best interests of the child in a particular case. That is correct, yes. Okay. Uh, and I know we kind of walk through some of the things that you do in a given case. Mm -hmm. uh, would that be typical in terms of interviewing the parties, the children, and generating reports? Yes, yes, it is very typical. Okay. Uh, 
another topic that I wanted to talk about because when a lot of people come to me and I'm sure that's the same with you Walt and you Terry uh, is that they have what I like to call the versus mindset uh, so mm -hmm. it seems like a lot of people come with the impression that it's them versus mom or them versus dad and ultimately one side is going to win mm -hmm. a custody dispute mm -hmm. uh, that may be true in a contract dispute or a landlord tenant situation uh, but I at least for one don't view that to be the appropriate framework uh, for when parents are attempting to provide for custody and parenting time of their children uh, so Terry, let's start with you. Uh, do you see that versus mindset in custody matters? And if so, what do you say to someone with that mindset and why? Um, yes, unfortunately we do see that. Uh, I think it comes out of uh, people's ideas of court and, um, uh, you know, suing something or, you know, they're going to win something. It's that win-lose attitude. Um, but when it comes down to children, um, it's it's needs to be more cooperative. Um, parents are the, the people that know their children best. And uh, if they can cooperate with one another, um, the children by far uh, will be better off to, um, you know, through a divorce or a paternity action. Uh, they'll handle it a lot better if the parents uh, don't take that mindset of, I'm going to win or you're going to lose that that scenario. Um, if they work cooperatively, then then it's a win-win situation for both, and it's just excuse me, definitely a win for the um, children. I assume mm -hmm. that's a tone that you have to set early on, and then and hopefully manage throughout the life of a case. Uh, yes, we we try very hard to <laughs> to set that tone. <laughs> a lot of times it doesn't work, but we try. Mm -hmm. And and in that vein, it might sound counterintuitive to some when they're told that they're going to go to court. Number one. Mm -hmm. Um, they're getting an attorney, mm -hmm. uh, and it's possible that a judge, the, the person that puts on the robe, is going to make decisions about their lives and the lives of their children. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> but we still tell them the idea is that notwithstanding all of that, you have to work together. Uh, so, Walt, from your perspective as an attorney, how can a good attorney help a client navigate through the legal process, number one? Number two, be an advocate for their client, and then still adhere to principles of cooperation and co-parenting? I think first we have to keep in mind that when a client comes to me, they're in an incredible amount of stress. Mm -hmm. You know, the, their marriage is falling apart or their relationships falling apart. Um, it's felt throughout the household. The, the children perceive what's going on. And with the parents, generally it's over between them, but they have the children that are gonna be there and the children are gonna love both parents, but they can divide the property, they can d divide the money and the debts, but the children are gonna be there the rest of their lives. And the parents need to realize that children are gonna love both parents mm -hmm. and uh, they don't like to choose and they, we, uh, guardian ad litems do a very good job of trying to make sure they don't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the, uh, the judges uh, in Wayne County in particular have done a very good job of pushing this cooperation model, a cooperative model to uh, our local rules uh, require us to do that, to sit down with the clients and say, here's how we need to work together on this. Um, my clients uh, generally uh, don't go to court all that much. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it is getting the essential facts from the client at the outset and then working either with the other side or with another attorney to try and, and work through what's there. Um, but Terry's correct that you're always going to have this I'm going to win attitude. Mm -hmm. and, and let's talk about the idea that uh, oftentimes parties don't need to go to a courtroom if they're able to work with one another and resolve mm -hmm. issues. So I know at least in my own practice when someone comes to me for an initial consult I find myself telling people uh, I don't think you need me for the reason that you think you need me. Mm -hmm. uh, so you touched on some of the things that an attorney does, and, and mm -hmm. certainly in conjunction with the guardian ad litem, uh, but navigating procedural issues. Uh, mm -hmm. So what to file to initiate a case, uh, and then what's expected to be filed uh, in a case as we go along. <clears throat> uh, we have to know things about rules of evidence and proposed orders. So talk to me about the procedure and why that's important for people. Uh, when you file your petition for dissolution of marriage, and I'll focus on that area, um, you're also filing a motion for custody and parenting time uh, with another party and also uh, child support um, and related issues such as uh, medical uh, expenses and how you handle medical treatment for the children. Um, in addition to that, 
every time we file something with the court, we're required to file a cooperation update, which mm -hmm. says uh, what uh, efforts we've made to uh, reduce the tension in between the parties, uh, what issues have we tried to resolve and get that uh, done ahead of time. Uh, but we also have to give uh, financial information, tax returns, uh, pay stubs, so that we know how much support's going to be owed and if we're dividing property down the road, uh, how much each party has. There's a financial declaration um, form people need to fill out. Um, we also have the um, uh, exchange of uh, witness list if we're going to, to uh, trial. And so, uh, and the parents have to, as Terry mentioned earlier, have to go to these um, uh, two uh, websites uh, mm -hmm. while they're going through this process. Yeah, and, and I want to talk about that more in just a minute. Um, sort of leading into that, though, um, when we talk about parties and parents, those are those are terms that we use. Uh, but oftentimes, at least I think in the old school uh, train of thought, and I think still some other counties use mm -hmm. petitioner and respondent. Mm -hmm. Correct. Uh, and, and that, to me, is sort of a, a sterile term that doesn't really reflect the fact that these are parents mm -hmm. that we're dealing with. Uh, <clears throat> so when I was thinking about that in preparation for the show, uh, I thought about one really good identifier that um, tells us what we call people and that's a caption of a case mm -hmm. uh, and I know maybe a lot of people aren't familiar with that term uh, but if uh, one of you could tell me about what our judges expect us to call the parties what we refer to them as and why that's important it's you know it's it's uh, if I'm representing dad it's you know he's going there as a father uh, you know John Smith father you know Jane Smith mother uh, it's not that hostility versus mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, when we go to the other counties we forget that sometimes because it's, uh, it's so routine for us here but again our judges did a good job of trying to uh, create in a simple thing just even the caption of a case that we're trying to make sure that the children um, are, the danger to them through or the uh, trauma to them through a disillusion is minimized as much as it can mm -hmm. and that sets the tone of the case so uh, uh, and, and we, f we follow that. And I know when we even uh, address these issues amongst one another, Terry, mm -hmm. oftentimes when we refer to our clients, I'll mm -hmm. say, Mom said this, Mom, or I talked to Dad about this. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do that with my own clients in the office, mm -hmm. and they look at me funny sometimes. Why are you calling me Dad? Mm -hmm. But that has been ingrained mm -hmm. yeah. in me. And, and I think that's good, and hopefully that happens with the parties of the case, yeah, too. Yeah, I, I, I think the respondent and petitioner, uh, those titles or, or names are, are adversarial. Right. And uh, when you use mother and father, you're identifying their role here, and that's important. Uh, we need to remember that the the children in this they only have one mom and they only have one dad, and and you know that's I think a, a good reason to use those titles. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and I think that's a good lead into another thought that I had about this. Um, I, I think we could all. Uh, say which judge likes to say this to people, but when things tend to get a little bit contentious, uh, mm -hmm. he'll stop that conversation and say, listen, your mom and your mm -hmm. dad, mm -hmm. and you two are going to have to learn how to coexist, co-parent, and work together for the next 16, 17 years of this child's life, whatever mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of that is, that really boils down our local rules to me, that statement that we hear so often. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I'd like to do is kind of zoom in on our local rules a little bit and talk about those and how they pertain to cooperation. Um, I, I looked at the most pertinent parts of the local rules before coming here this evening. Uh, number one, we must act as co-problem solvers and not mere problem reporters. Uh, further, we're expected to focus our attention on the children's needs, including an awareness that parent conflict is gravely dangerous to the children, which both of you have touched on a little bit previously. Uh, so what I'd like to do is hear from both of you as to why these local rules are important uh, and how you and your respective roles carry that out in, in your day-to-day -day jobs. Um, so Walt? I think it's it's over the years, and for those who've been practicing longer than the newer ones, it takes a bit of adjustment to, uh, but it, it's slowly sinking into people that one, uh, and we've always had a, a fairly good deal of uh, civility here, but I think it's been even better recently uh, between the attorneys. But also, you you do that in treating the other client. You know, you try not to demean you know another parent you know and, and try and and as we said winners or losers uh, you, you try and work in a cooperative uh, mode for that um, I, I think the uh, other part of it is uh, uh, we we're as attorneys we're not allowed to interview the children that's only strictly by the guardian ad litem 
Uh, and so the cooperation updates uh, force us to say, oops, we got to contact the other attorney and work with him or her to, to try and see how we can get these people on a, a path to make a resolution that's satisfactory to both of them. Right. And then, Terry, from your perspective as a guardian ad litem, how does that play out in your, your daily job? Um, daily. We're, we're always trying to be, uh, you know, communicators or encouraging um, parents to communicate with one another. I know all uh, three of the uh, current guardian ad litems, we all um, communicate with our clients, um, moms and dads, through emails, and we try to encourage that communication um, between the two, uh, the two parents. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have to get on them a little bit to say, you know, tone it down or, or uh, you know, do, do the right thing, take the, take the high road um, in a lot of uh, areas. Um, another thing, too, is, is um, you know, protecting the children's best interests. Uh, conflict causes uh, children uh, so much trauma, and uh, you, I think parents sometimes think that they're protecting their kids by, uh, that they say that they're not talking about the other parent or, or whatever, and, mm -hmm. and uh, kids know what's going on. They, they figured it out real quick. Uh, and so, you know, I think if, if we can bring this to the forefront and say, you know, don't, don't talk about the other parent in front, of, mm -hmm. in front of your child. If you're angry with the other parent, uh, do it in private, not in front of the children, um, because they, they're still going to pick up on that anger and conflict. Sure. And I think your comments about the children pick that up. That applies almost regardless of their age, even if they're oh, under five, you know, they pick up the, the body language yes. and, and oh, the, absolutely. the tone of voice and things of like that. Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, in addition then to limiting parent conflict and functioning as problem solvers, uh, we also expect our clients to engage in what we call website work uh, and also the parenting class. Uh, so Terry, I, I think you probably know more about that than just about anyone in Wayne County, but <laughs> say maybe Barb Maley is on the same level as you. So if you could tell us about that a little bit. Well, I, I uh, stopped teaching the parenting class earlier this year. Um, there are two uh, teachers. Barb Maley is a current guardian ad litem, and uh, she's, she teaches that along with Susan Pointis, who was a former guardian ad litem. So mm -hmm. um, both good, uh, good people to teach the class. Uh, they try to... Um, uh, you know, they bring the parents are required to be there. They don't want to be there. A lot of them don't want to be there. But we we try to give them uh, information uh, on what the expectation is of court. Um, uh, what uh, uh, some people who uh, choose to go through this process without an attorney, pro se clients. Um, uh, we try to inform them that, you know, if they move, they have to do a notice of intent mm -hmm. to move, uh, those sorts of things. Um, so there's, there's that, what expectations are. Uh, and then Susan does a really good job of uh, explaining to parents how this affects their kids. Um, and it doesn't matter, like, like uh, Walt said, it doesn't matter if they're infants in arms or teenagers and even adult children. Um, they are affected by their parents' conflict. Mm -hmm. And so um, she does a really good job about uh, explaining uh, how it affects children. And, and sometimes there are parents that literally break down and cry in this class um, because, you know, they're doing some of the things that we tell them not to do and it, you know, they really take it to heart. Then there's others that just, you know, it, in one ear and out the mm -hmm. other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can tell you from my own personal experience, I have clients pretty frequently say, do I really have to do that? Is mm -hmm. there something you could do to get that requirement mm -hmm. waived? Mm -hmm. uh, my answer is always no. Mm -hmm. uh, e even if there is a mechanism for me to try, I'm not willing typically to do that uh, yeah. because mm -hmm. I think you'll extract something of value from that process. Right. Uh, and more often than not, the people that tell me that they really didn't want to take the time out to go take that class, tell me that they learned something from mm -hmm. it and, and mm -hmm. are glad that they did attend it. Yeah. Uh, now, prior to attending the class, parents have to do what we call website work, correct? Correct. Yes, they. Uh, if if they were married and going through a divorce, they have to go through uptoparents.org, mm -hmm. and then uh, if they were in a relationship and uh, children were conceived, child or children were conceived, uh, and they've separated, then um, it's proudtoparent.org, and there are exercises that they have to do, and. Um, 
there are really good videos um, on that. And if they take the time to read the material and watch the videos, um, it is eye-opening. And um, Charlie Asher is the one that put this together. And mm -hmm. um, he, he does a, a wonderful job of, of showing uh, how um, conflict, parent conflict, affects children. He also, and it, there's the video of the three sisters that does, um, uh, shows how the children, different ages, there's three girls, and um, how their parents' divorce affects them both physically, mentally, uh, socially. Mm -hmm. um, it even shows how the, the girls kind of manipulate their parents into doing things. Then the reverse of that is the daughter's story, and it's a girl who parents uh, divorced when she was very young, and they got along. And she said it was hard. She wanted her parents together, but then she learned that she had this uh, two families who loved her and celebrated her life. And so when she graduated from college, she had uh, a, not only a mom and dad, but she had uh, step step parents mm -hmm. and step si or step siblings or half siblings and mm -hmm. and uh, they were all there to support her. So, you know, you can choose how to go through this. You can either be in conflict constantly, or you can decide that you're going to get along the best that you can. Sure, and so. I think probably all of us sitting here have seen that happen with people and families we know that when they split up and those that have worked well, mm -hmm. you know, they may not like each other, or may uh, have difficulty getting over stuff. But in terms of the kids, there are a lot of, several people I know are like that. Yes. And it makes a difference when you see their kids grow up because mm -hmm. there's not any of that hostility or, or um, which is what these rules mm -hmm. uh, are designed to uh, encourage people to act that way. And that's right, and, and it's a great story that Terry gave as well as your examples, But and I assume, Terry, at least on an anecdotal level, you've seen people that adhere to the rules and vest in the rules that are put in place by our judges mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. actually succeed and do well and, and be that success story. Absolutely, yes. Um, and it's, it, it, I find it, you know, in any dissolution case or paternity case, you want to get on top of it at the start because you want to get them into good habits early mm -hmm. on, and if you work with them that way and try and get them to say, you know, you got to work together on this, and you know, it, it's nobody knows the case like they do, mm -hmm. and if if they work at it and they get guidance from a, uh, not only the attorney but the guardian ad litem, uh, it'll help them, uh, a person, make a better decision. And I, I, I want to dovetail on that. I may be veering a little bit off course from, from uh, the outline that I put together in my mind, uh, but I, I think it's important to note that when people come to us, Walt and I as attorneys, or they see you or Barbara mm -hmm. Vicky as the GALs, uh, they are typically in one of the worst places in their life. Mm -hmm. uh, these mm -hmm. people are not behaving and acting in a way that's representative of who they typically are. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when they hear from us that you need to be cordial and amicable <laughs> and be cooperative, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they take that the wrong way when they normally otherwise uh -huh. wouldn't. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so we see that. So I, I just mm -hmm. want to make that point that you know okay. these things are being expressed because it does work. Yeah. Well, and I get that too. People say, well, I want an attorney who's going to fight for me. And I'm saying, no, I'm working for you. You know, uh -huh. It's not fighting like the other side, but if I'm prepared, you're going to come out, you know, the way you need to come out. Yeah. Right. And I tell people, hey, you know, if you go to McDonald's and you smile at the person across the counter when you're ordering your hamburger and Diet Coke, then there's no reason why you can't be nice and smile at the person who is the other parent mm -hmm. of your children because you both love them. Right. And, and so, you know, it, it is a practice and, and you have to practice at it. Right. And we're kind of touching on this already, but uh, with the theme of cooperation and our local rules, um, they provide that any conference with the court that we have, the purpose is to reduce conflict, build mm -hmm. cooperation, and preserve family relationships, and then respond to the needs of the children that are involved in the case. Um, so, Walt, I know you kind of talked about this from an attorney's perspective, but Terry, how do you see a good attorney assist in that regard so that the parties, the attorneys, and the GAL are all working from that same playbook? Well, I, I think, you know, mainly um, reduce conflict, uh, you know, while supporting their, their client, they also have to be aware that there are 
there are some little people here that don't have representation mm -hmm. and um, you know uh, that those what is in their best interest is first and foremost yeah. and you know always 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 best for the children is is for the moms and dads who know them the best to decide mm -hmm. and you know we've got to bring them together and uh, figure out you know not only to separate the pots and pans mm -hmm. and you know get the financial stuff uh, resolved but do what's best for the kids and uh, uh, attorneys can can kind of lead their their clients down that way uh, to help uh, for lack of better, you know, to mm -hmm. put a buffer between, right. you know, yeah. try to uh, get the parties to lessen their anger, I guess, yeah. would be the best way. And, and that's certainly one avenue, the preferred avenue, uh, but we know that unfortunately there are those cases that sometimes they just have to be tried. People mm -hmm. need their day in court on, on some mm -hmm. issues and, and it's unavoidable, uh, no matter how hard we work to adhere to those local rules. Uh, so when we get to that point, Walt, you talked about pretrial conferences and status conferences, informal and formal mediations that we'll have prior to any formal hearing. Uh, when we get to that point, um, and, and we're running low on time, but give, give us a sense of what people might expect and why it's a good idea to try to find those agreements prior to placing it in the judge's hands. Uh, one, one simple thing is money. It's That's gonna true. take a lot of time mm -hmm. when you have to prepare for trial. And um, it's, uh, you know, we're, we have to get together all the information. We have to go over all the notes that our, we had with our clients. We had to prep them for witnesses. And uh, the, uh, the court it could last a half day, could last a whole day. And the judge will be the first to tell you if, uh, as they frequently do, if I make a decision and you're both dissatisfied, I know I made the right choice. Right. And as a mediator, uh, I mediate domestic cases, I've told people, I said, this way you get con control the outcome mm -hmm. when you mediate successfully between the two of you. Right. Well, the takeaways, I think, uh, are that family law isn't about mom versus dad or who's going to win, uh, but it's about attempting to work together to co-parent and keeping the best interests of your children in mind. Uh, and in fact, I know our judges require that, and that's what we're mm -hmm. talking about relative to our local rules. Uh, so I appreciate you both being here this evening to talk about this with me. I know you're both busy, uh, and I appreciate all of you for watching uh, another episode of Legal Briefs mm -hmm. brought to you by the BBKCC Law Firm. What is discussed on this program is meant to be for general information and educational purposes. It is not intended to be legal advice and should not be used for that purpose. If you have legal matters you need help with, then you need to seek the advice of an attorney.